Welcome to the Foreign Correspondent Club of Japan. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, my name is Pierre Milia. I'm uh, uh, chairing this uh, press online by famous uh, and controversial um, Chinese artist uh, Ai Weiwei, who is uh, uh, online from Portugal. His uh, last choice, most recent choice, uh, of country where he's now living after having experienced uh, Germany and uh, England. Um, the issue today is uh, the anniversary of uh, Wuhan. As you know, exactly a year ago, uh, the Chinese authorities performed the biggest probably ever made uh, lockdown uh, of a big city. Uh, with millions of people involved, not only in city, but in the city, but in the whole uh, province. And it was, uh, to put it uh, uh, in with uh, Ai Weiwei himself words, as brutal as efficient. And uh, we asked uh, Weiwei to uh, come and uh, talk to us uh, because he authored a, a beautiful documentary uh, called The Coronation. This is not his first uh, uh, documentary, uh, but uh, certainly is the one uh, that has been less successful because not only it is forbidden in China, of course, but it's also have been also rejected by most international film festival around the world, including Venice International Film Festival, which usually welcomed his um, performances. So uh, I don't think Kai Weiwei needs any introduction. Everybody knows him. Uh, welcome him and uh, ask him to give us a brief, I uh, said, uh, so uh, how do you say in English? <laughs> a brief, a brief uh, 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 welcoming. And then uh, we'll go into question and answers as he himself uh, requested because he doesn't want to make speeches. Am I right, uh, Weiwei? Thank you. <coughs> it's nice to be here. Also nice to know um, you was uh, uh, interested or risk this interest from Japan. And uh, I maybe I should give some background of the film. The film we uh, started. Uh, uh, we start to make a documentary from two thousand three, the first pandemic SARS happened in China. That time I made my first documentary with my brother, uh, uh, just recording the social phenomenon under the political control. It's very soft, very kind, uh, very loose uh, documentary 2003. But when this pandemic started, I already uh, should have some pre preparation, I already made the films Human Flow, the rest, and, uh, and uh, a few other uh, documentary films. So we decided to record this historical events. Of course, we don't know how historical it's going to be, and we don't, we cannot predict how seriously this can develop. And uh, unfortunately, we are still in there, uh, inside this, and uh, the death toll daily are uh, growing up. And uh, it's not a China's matter, but uh, the global matter, as we all know. China have become a part of the global um, global political and economic conditions. And anything happens in China would affect uh, the whole world. So under this kind of understanding, I started to, to make a documentary in Wuhan, which is very difficult. The city uh, had an extreme lockdown. That means uh, they would not let anybody out, even walk the doors of the resident 
or beaten or uh, take them to police custody and uh, you know lock them up. There are a few people trying to do some so-called citizen investigation, and uh, they're just reporting with the iPhone on the street has been locked up. One recently um, being sentenced. She never really did anything. She just want to tell us how the city look like. And the three others still missing. You know, nobody know where they are. The police took them until today. Nobody know where those people who supposed to do like a citizen report, where are they? So under this kind of condition, we start our documentary film. Uh, two things are very difficult. First, uh, city is locked up. Second, which should be first, I'm not allowed to go back to China or, you know, it's dangerous for my position to be there. So I have to do it remotely. Fortunately, we have a lot of colleagues, friends, artists, associates, and the old uh, uh, associates, they locked into the city. So I start to have a conversation with them. I ask them to record their life with their cameras, if they have iPhone or if they need uh, something, you know, small and uh, uh, just record their life. And uh, so finally we, we gathered uh, a team about 10 to 20 people, about 20 people. Uh, most of them are amateurs, artists, activists, or my old colleagues. And some of them are technicians, you know, who, who know how to fly, draw, fly drones or stuff like that. So I did it remotely in Rome, Italy, uh, where I was doing the opera, Torandat. So every day in the daytime, I'm doing the opera. At the nighttime, I'm uh, speaking to my camera person and uh, directing them what kind of image how they should, uh, uh, how, how should they uh, um, provide better uh, image and sound. And, uh, you know, I, uh, daily, day and night. So I have to work uh, uh, very uh, <laughs> intensively with uh, them. So many, many very, uh, as a result, many very uh, impressive sad but impressive uh, uh, stories come seeing. So we start to editing. And with my girlfriend, we edited in, in, in London. And she's a filmmaker and editor. So we efficiently finished the film even by the last July. So then we realized how should we give to the public? Then you know, normally I know how to make a film, but I don't know how to distribute a film. So there's a platform such as Venice or Toronto Film Festival or New York Film Festival coming up. So we applied all those. And uh, of course, they all love the film. They couldn't believe that's finished. It's about Wuhan, about China, and it's about the pandemic. And nobody ever did so fast, so efficient, and so uh, clearly reflects the situation with the first-hand material. And also, the film is not only about the pandemic, it's about Chinese, it's about Chinese society, it's about political situation, it's about people, it's about ordinary people, how do they feel, and how do they suffer through, and how, how they accept the situation or not accept the situation. So, but the final words from the festivals is all clear. We cannot show it. So, of course, there's no further, uh, uh, how to say, explanation, but uh, it's very, very easy to, anybody knows the film industry and knows the, the West distribution uh, system, I would know the biggest market of film is China. Uh, even Hollywood, uh, China has taken about uh, like 40% of in, uh, investment in Hollywood movies. So uh, any film director, film uh, actress, actors, or anything related to film, 
and the distributions, uh, film festivals, and the, they love to have their films to be presented in China and all the buyers uh, come from there. Even the American film chain like uh, uh, IMAT uh, have uh, thousands of screens in China. And that considered as the biggest achievement by Obama administration. And also at that time, Biden was on the same trip to China to achieve that, to have more films to, to be, Hollywood films to be shown in, in China. So that's how it works. You know, the West pre, uh, present entertainment and uh, China uh, buying that. So they, they cannot risk to have my films, my name, even just my name. And also not risk to have my film about China. It's not very crit critical film. It's very, I think it's very balanced and very soft. You know, I try to show the, 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 the Chinese rather than political situation. So, so we've been refused. They also give to Netflix, Amazon, you know, big uh, online platform also being refused. They love the film. They said they simply cannot take it because uh, their procedures will take uh, another many, many months to, to, to really put it. I was wondering, you know, as an internet uh, platform, you can put film next second. It's not, a, not difficult for, for any platform. You know, I can do it uh, right away. But why they have to take many, many months and they can never really uh, make it. So I decided to put my films uh, right on the uh, Vimeo. That, that's the short story. I, uh, can I interrupt you? Sorry. Uh, I, I have already a question from a colleague of GG Press, Noriko Hirara. Uh, you mentioned all these rejections, but uh, did they give you some specific <laughs> answers, reasons why <laughs> they did not accept uh, your movie. For example, Venice or Netflix or Amazon. Uh, you know, Venice in the past has been very generous with you. Uh, did they made a specific reason? The, at the beginning, when they see the film, the directors of the selecting film, they are so excited. They, they couldn't believe it. They recommend finally to the head of the festival and uh, then the, the answer is uh, they cannot accept it. They, of course, when they give me a reason that I can speak about the reason, but uh, there's no reason. And uh, we, as we all understand with this kind of political decisions is all about, you know what? You know, Chinese always say, you ask a reason, they will say, you know what? You know, so, <laughs> Um, I have no reason, but uh, I, it's not my prediction. I have a lot of uh, people in Chinese film industry and uh, the, the annually, they are filmmakers, they are award winners, and they come to the festivals. And sometimes we meet, you know, we have a chat. I said, uh, do you know why they, they cannot accept my film? They said, well, the first thing they would ask any Chinese film director is, do you have the dragon seal? Dragon Seal is uh, China's propaganda uh, department, you know, really a core communist uh, censorship department would, uh, uh, how to say, proof a film. When you start writing the script, they would read through line by line. Then they would ask you to change maybe could be 100 times. Then they think you can pass. Then you start make a film. You can, you know, it can be millions of dollars put in there. Even after you finish, they're still going to relook at it. If you, if you meet their, you know, censorship, they would prove you finally give you a drug dragon seal. If you see any film when it started, any Chinese film with a dragon, red dragon. That means that's being approved by the communist uh, ideology and the censorship. So any film festival, when they, I, I'm talking about the major ones, not the small ones. 
they would ask first change director, do you have that? If you don't have that, they will not even look at it because uh, that means uh, they will be in trouble if later they select this film because China would uh, had a, a big argument. So if we remember last time when Zhang Yimou present his film uh, One Second, you know, he does have the dragon seal, but he doesn't have not have the proof to show it outside of China. So he privately presented it to Berlin Film Festival right before the uh, the festival started. The the festival have to take him down under the China's demanding. So the reason is technical problem. Come on, we <laughs> all know what uh, <laughs> technical problem means. That's just as, as much as as you know, you know. So this is a very open, very common knowledge. Uh, need no argument. All the West major film industry are completely collapsed under Chinese money and the market. Uh, I, wait, wait. Uh, does this apply to uh, Tokyo International Film Festival too? Did you apply and were you rejected? Um, okay, put it again. Uh, did uh, this happen also with the Tokyo International Film Festival? Did you submit your work and were you rejected or you didn't submit at all? I, I, I submit, submit almost all the film festivals, <coughs> um, and, but my human flow was accepted, you know, about the global refugee yes. situation by Venice and they gave a very good uh, presentation at uh, that time. But, uh, uh, but later, you know, I, I did many other films, such as the film about 43 Mexico's disappearing students, and uh, that being refused by many major festivals, uh, mostly by Berlin Film Festival, and uh, we, every year we try because I was in Berlin and uh, it's very natural. I'm being considered as German artist and uh, doing the major films, which, uh, which uh, documents our time, you know, the, the most uh, biggest crisis. My film always received the best review among the guardians and, you know, financial uh, time or, or New York Times, Los Angeles Times or Hollywood Report, you know, all those papers, they gave me four or five stars, you know, all, all seriously have a long article about my films, but festivals just cannot. It's a business. It's not only film festival. If you talk about in the West, major universities, Harvard, and uh, you talk about MIT, you talk about all the major uh, universities, um, could be Cambridge or anyone, and, uh, uh, and the German universities, they're deeply associated with China. And they will never, ever even to touch me. You know, I, I'm being interviewed by all the very, you know, a lot of talks and the important talks. I, I did uh, over 1,000 interviews, but all those universities they, they don't want to be, you know, to, 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 to invite me or whatever. So uh, we all know China's soft power has been very influential and uh, they're doing very well. And uh, I, you know, <laughs> I, I am quite surprised actually. Uh, anyway, just uh, um, related to this, I wanted to inform everybody who's following us uh, that uh, you were so kind to give us uh, a special access uh, for watching this movie for free for 48 hours. And the link is uh, in the notice uh, of this um, press conference. Uh, as a suggestion, did you think uh, about doing like Michael Moore did in the past? Uh, since you cannot show it uh, you know, uh, in cinemas, uh, would you consider in the near future to put it free on internet? I, I it's already on internet. It's a, uh, you know, it, because it's a self-production, um, we, we still charge a few bucks there, but uh, 
I think uh, just for the sincerity, you know, people really want that, you know, it's, it's like a cup, of, a cup of coffee, but yes. make the film is very, very, uh, extremely difficult. If you watch the next one about the Hong Kong, then you understand. It risks your life to make films like that, about Hong Kong, uh, the film called The Cockroach. And yeah. I, you should watch it. And uh, I think you should uh, just, uh, 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 pay a few bucks and uh, show respect to the film. And yes. it's not about the money, it's my self-production. I don't need to uh, borrow or return any favor for anybody, but I do respect what I've been showing, you know, the people in the film and the, 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 all the people who are making the film, which uh, is very, you know, it's not, I'm not doing entertainment. I'm not trying to please my audience or please anybody you know I don't care about the film festivals I don't give damn shit about them but there are the platform they should present minimal uh, 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 meaningful and the uh, and, uh, films that's their duty but if they f they are f such a failure of this duty I feel shame about them okay uh, there is a question here from the floor um, Isabel Reynolds from Bloomberg. Can you come to the microphone, please? Hi, uh, my name is Isabel Reynolds. I'm a reporter with Bloomberg. Um, I'm also actually president of the club. Um, so I'd like to thank you very much for um, appearing today to talk to us. Um, I have a couple of questions. One is you mentioned that people are risking their lives to make films like this. Um, how concerned are you that the people who collaborated with you on this particular film might be in some kind of danger. Um, and I'd also like to ask about, about your living in Europe now. D do you feel safe there? I know that China is, has long tentacles and tries to find ways of um, making life difficult for dissidents outside its own borders. Um, but do you think that you are safe in Portugal? Um, first, um, we are not making entertainment. We are making a film about a reality and that reality is very crude. So the danger is always there. And uh, our filmmakers, I would always ask them, do they want a real name or real identity to be presented like our camera person? And uh, many of them said, uh, we don't care. You know, we, what we tell is the truth why we should care. You know, I really, really admire their courage, but some of them, they have jobs maybe in government sector, they will say, I prefer not to reveal. So we, we would always ask them uh, what to do about it. You know, when the film we did about Hong Kong, uh, we interviewed the two police uh, people and they have to cover their face. We had to change their voice. This is very normal practice. And also some activists, they have to change their, their voice. That's the first question, you know, because life is a priority and uh, we cannot sacrifice any life uh, for, for any purpose. Second is, uh, uh, do I feel dangerous? I, first, I, I, I'm, I'm not a very good in feel personal uh, you know, does not have good sense about personal safety. That's why I got involved with so many uh, issues, which many people would never, never even touch it because they, they would think how ridiculous you are. And, uh, you know, but I did, you know, because I'm lacking uh, that kind of sensitivity. And uh, also, I don't think I'm not dangerous. I'm not as dangerous as anybody activists in Russia. China never really, uh, for my record, a poisoning uh, uh, someone in uh, put something on their tea. You know, that's not China's uh, uh, way of doing things. They they may they may not like me, but they will not do things like that, that will be really looked down by everybody. And also China is not uh, Saudi and uh, it will not uh, put their own journalist uh, in, in Turkey's uh, embassy and uh, just, uh, just kill it. You know, uh, 
this kind of thing is for me even shocking. How can a government uh, to perform in such a dirty matter? And uh, but this is uh, obviously the whole world is know, and everybody knows how the, where the danger come from, and how this the, those uh, government performs. And uh, but still, that's not a cup of tea. Everybody really care? I don't think so. I don't think that even the mainstream uh, journalism uh, are really uh, care about it. So, you know, there's much worse situation than me. If you talk about uh, uh, Julian Assange, you know, he just provide a platform for journalism. He's not even investigator. He, he doesn't leak in the, the information except he, plan, you know, provide a journalism platform. He's a perfect journalism person, but he has been going through such unfair treatment and the US won't put him behind the bar 175 years. Do we see many mainstream uh, media talk about it? You know, it's, if we're journalists as a community, do we defend our essential uh, meaning of being a journalist or absolute value of being what a freedom means if without freedom of speech and freedom of price. You know, we see things getting worse and worse in the world, but journalism certainly bear a big responsibility and uh, of what has been happening. You know, the mainstream journalism has been such unthinkable, uh, politically correct uh, group Many things you cannot mention, many things you cannot talk about, you cannot discuss about. If you discuss about that, you're dead. You know, we see the American election, you know, what happens there. And that raises the question, what kind of society we are going? And, uh, you know, danger is always there. Um, I have other, uh, can we move a little bit from, uh, from your documentary and go into the, I'm sure you know that in these days, after many delays, the WHO mission is uh, eventually in China, in Wuhan. Um, mm. If you could uh, speak with the head of the WHO delegate who are there now, where would you tell them to focus on the most in their investigation? This is a question from Irgin Yulmaz of BBC Turkey. I, I uh, clearly they are there after one year, they are there. First, it's ironic they are there after one year. So that shows how they perform. And uh, if we look at the beginning, how the head of WHO, uh, um, they they clearly said how China uh, did a great job and uh, the pandemic is not a disease uh, uh, can be transmitted human to human and uh, it's not a really pandemic and not, nobody should worry. You know, they, they did that and, uh, you know, it's on record. So we all know the head of WHO has such a strong relationship with uh, the leaders in China. And uh, you know this is uh, is uh, also on record. So, so you don't expect much from them. Can we trust a uh, 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 you know organization under UN and uh, which are not really politically conscious about the the, the, the really what's happening, but rather to to try to get their fund and trying to 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 have their bureaucracy and, uh, you know, I, we cannot trust WHO, which need a really an independent uh, investigation. You know, uh, if WHO went to China, they cannot even look at the, the, uh, the so-called the Wuhan uh, Pandemic Research Center, or they don't ask the right questions. You know, there are still people missing from that center. And how can they find out the original? It's all become uh, some kind of play. And that play will not help the people uh, in the world who suffered, who passed away, and who, who really desperately want to find out what is really going on. 
And uh, if we cannot achieve that little thing, why we need WHO, you know? And uh, also what will happen next? Um, there is another question from uh, Nikkei Asia, Grace Lee. Uh, how China's handling of the coronavirus uh, pandemic may have changed people's perceptions of the Communist Party leadership, both within and outside China? Well, I think uh, that, that question is, uh, it takes a long answer. China is a, a authoritarian society, that means uh, simply the human rights issue, humanity and the private life is not really existing. Freedom of a price is not existing. Independent judicial system is not existing, you know. So, so when you have a society like that, the control is very much like a military control. So in the military, you have a clear code. You do things which not really about an individual likes it or not, but you just have to follow. So in that kind of society, they can lock down a city, they can put people away, put journalists uh, behind bars and uh, you know, uh, erase all the questions and not take responsibility and not bear you know, uh, the responsibility. And they also can get the, all the glories. And uh, so, so I don't think the West and really truly understand what China is like. But in the West, still, you cannot control the disease. You know, disease is a disease. It's something which uh, be, beyond the human understanding. So it's something new. It's not only China's problem. And we should understand this is also a global problem. But China played a very important role only because at the beginning, they should not hide the information. They should openly let international be, uh, you know, scientists or people to be informed and involved. But of course, nobody really understands that this is going to be so bad. And, uh, but uh, still, till today or t in the future, we still not get the truth out. Uh, same person has a follow up. Uh, um, one subject of the documentary is the retired party cadre who tirelessly defended the Chinese government and its policies. How representative is she in China today? Um, that's the really reason I would put her she uh, to be there. You know, after years of the, the communist control, I think the majority of the people, especially elderly people, uh, 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 can be identified as this old lady. You know, her son is a contemporary art artist. He is very in very different position, but the lady formally believes in communist and in the, in the leadership. Okay. Um, let me see, there is another question here from Japan Forward, Ariel Bozetto. Um, what is your message specifically to the Japanese audience about what could be done after having seen this film? What can the individual and the politicians do in Japan to address the Japanese situation? I, I, I'm not, not, I didn't follow the, the Japan situation clearly, but uh, as I understand they controlled the situation pretty well because I know Japan is uh, like Tokyo is very uh, dense uh, with population and the uh, and very busy movement. And uh, still, uh, Japan has never really uh, uh, reached the, as high the level as England or 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 other cities in the West. So I think uh, uh, any society should treat this pandemic as a, as a, uh, some natural disaster. 
with cultures and also um, care about the community, not just individual life, but the, the public. So uh, do, doing uh, accordingly uh, to about our moral judgment and our uh, understanding about the nature. So it's not really uh, government doesn't have the power to control the disease. Nobody can. And uh, so we just have to be careful. That's, that's all we can do, you know, and just be careful, uh, respect life. And uh, um, that's all I can say. Uh, another question from Nick Kay, Kenji Kawase. That's a very interesting question. I mean, you mentioned before China is not poisoning or it's not killing or sending killers around the world, but sometimes they make people disappear, like in the case of Jack Ma. Um, I don't know if you know himself uh, personally, but you have also been somehow uh, disappeared for a short time very short time. What do you think happened to Mr. Ma? And uh, what do you think he has to do after he has been released uh, officially? We saw him uh, preaching or teaching to some uh, rural authorities in the last days. Well, and uh, I, I first, I think, uh, uh, yes, many, many people disappeared, many, uh, not just activists, but also lawyers, and uh, they have been put away. Under Chinese law, you can be under some kind of so-called uh, house, uh, uh, you know, you, house arrest, but it's never in a house, in somebody else's house maybe. Detention, yeah. And, uh, but uh, for a year or over a year, without inform a lawyer or inform uh, your family. So that means, uh, you're kidnapped by the state. I was uh, kidnapped by state for 81 days um, uh, while I was uh, in the airport of Beijing. And uh, that was uh, kind of dramatic and, uh, and uh, surreal. They put a black hole on your head and uh, drive you to somewhere. And then you'll never know where you are. Even the soldiers who are watching you would never even know where they are. They also been taken away like that. And after years, they are working in the same uh, same detention center. They still, after even they go back to their hometown, they still don't know what four years they, they were in army, you know, where they they are they are. You know they stayed, so it's very severe. But uh, China, as a authoritarian state, they think this is the best way to to control the information and, and brainwash people, and uh, that's how they do it. Come to uh, your question about Jack Ma, and I, I I know him, and I we had a we had a lunch or dinner together once. And I think he's a very careful person. When you grow up in China and in such a big business, you, you, you are very careful. I remember he doesn't even speak a sentence during the whole, whole evening. Just, just three of us have a <laughs> private dinner, you know. But he's very cautious. But still, um, I can see his business getting very big. And the, China, after all, is a communist society. Every economy is a state controlled. It's not a really private. So even his uh, in, uh, how to say, an enterprise, uh, namely as a private, but the shareholders are really uh, powerful people. So when they get in competition with the state, or with the financial system, of course, they will be seen as a dangerous move. And of course, they can anytime do anything to him, which is not surprising. So uh, I think he, he is alarmingly being put under some kind of restrictions. And uh, I hope he can pass this kind of audio. 
and uh, you know, be safe. Well, some people say that you too were somehow lucky because after those 80 days, after all, the Chinese authorities were kind of lenient, lenient with you. They let you go and now you live freely in Europe. Uh, let me try to make you uh, angry or funny. Um, you know your friend, uh, the UK former ambassador to China, Liu Xiaoming. He just quit his job after many, many years. He once defined you a minor artist uh, who made a fortune out of uh, insulting not only the Chinese government, but all the Chinese people, history and culture. What would you well, on that? Um, well, he, he made this on BBC and uh, watched it. And, uh, you know, the interesting thing is what he said is uh, maybe correct. I am a minor artist, and, uh, but I made a fortune is not correct. I, I never <laughs> trying to make a penny for my art. You know, maybe people push me into certain conditions because of our market, but it's not my will. And uh, criticizing Chinese government, which is true. But if his logic is right, I fully encourage all Chinese art do that because they all want to make a fortune. If you can make a fortune by criticizing uh, any government, please do it. You know, I would love to become an example for that, but I don't think anybody would follow that path. And uh, besides, we all know not only him, all the Chinese foreign ministry and the ambassadors sadly have become, uh, become um, brainless, just most time liars. So I really want to them to get more respect to either not to talk, if they have to talk, they have to respect the truth. Yeah, quite strong words. Uh, I mean, uh, you once told, uh, said that uh, you are loved in the West because you are considered an anti-communist, but you also reminded that you have been denouncing injustice uh, all over the world. I recollect your work uh, your field work in, during the Balkan crisis in Europe, the migrants and so on. Um, how would you define yourself? Uh, a, a liberal, a, a social activist? Uh, uh, I mean, also in the West, you have been criticized a lot. I, I used to think, uh, or other people think I'm liberal, but uh, until I realized liberal is such a dirty, a dirty words today. And uh, because most of them are detached from the reality. And uh, to being politically correct, I should say uh, liberals provide, uh, uh, represent a danger as much as a conservative or even more today. So let's face in the reality. I'm not an anti-communist. I'm anti-authoritarian. That authoritarian could be capitalist and also can be a cooperative authoritarian future we are all facing. You know, China is not communist anymore. China is state capitalism. And the state capitalism, that means the cooperative uh, really uh, manages our future. That is truly dangerous. We see the cooperative, how dangerous they are. Uh, if we say even the Twitter, which is the it's a uh, internet uh, I, I loved, you know, Twitter used to uh, be part of the so-called Arabic spring or, or, uh, or Iran revolution or, you know, or, or uh, uh, Egypt uh, uprising or all those things. But they can just block uh, on duty president the personal account or, you know, things like that. You can see things develop dramatically. There's no space for freedom of speech. 
not on the private level, not on the social level, and not in the political level. So what I'm defending is personal individual freedom, freedom of speech, which belongs to anybody, belongs to a criminal, belongs to an uh, unfit the president, and belongs to somebody in jail. So if we don't understand that part, we are truly in trouble. Okay, everybody, I think uh, we run out of uh, time. Um, <laughs> this, is, this is very philosophical. We are running out of time. Uh, sorry, there is just one last, last question from, from the floor here. Okay, come on. I don't know if we have a rented uh, time for the... Do it, do it. yes. Okay. Marta Wengen. Hi. Mara, sorry. Uh, hey, wait, wait. I've been an admirer of yours for a very long time. Um, anyway, um, do you think with what's happened in China that people who have suffered directly because of the pandemic are in some way emboldened to show their dissent? Um, in the film, for example, we see family members of victims of the coronavirus. Are these people speaking out more? Thank you. Um, <laughs> First, uh, who, who is this lady? She's uh, Mara Bangden from uh, Life... LifeGate, yes. LifeGate. Yes, I'm freelance, Hi. but I work in uh, sustainability journalism in Italy, actually. Hi. Mm. Hi. Nice she's uh, a pasta lover. I know that you don't like pasta, but she's a pasta lover. No, I, I, I like good pastas. I don't like uh, the common pastas. You know, there's always uh, very good pastas. And thank you for asking the question. Yeah. And the question rather is, do we learn or what do we learn from that? You know, uh, people always say, you know, we have a pandemic, how, what do we learn? Or we have the second world war, what do we learn from it? So in China, the case is very clear. There's many people who, who already used to suffer that's a problem you know the chinese culture suffer is a big main part of chinese culture we call it a ren ren means uh, uh, the words writing a knife above the heart the words ren means to to swallow the the badness or to suffer so also in japanese you have the words ren and uh and, uh, you know, people always blame themselves, not fortunate, and uh, the, their fate, but very rarely they blame the system. And uh, the one who makes some noise like me, I cannot stay there anymore. My, my, my name cannot be really uh, presented in China. So that teaches everybody if anybody who is not uh, suffer and tol tolerate, they either should disappear or they would suffer even more consequence. So I don't think there will be more, much more voice. There's a few people com um, compared to such a large uh, pandemic. And then not only in China, if you talk about the in, in the West, in US or in Europe, there's also many, many cases, I mean, um, but uh, fortunately, maybe they have a um, better judicial system can be solved, or they, I have no idea how, how this uh, will be handled. Thank you. I um, thank you so much for your time. Sorry to have uh, waken you up so early in uh, Portugal time. Hope to get no, you again. It's so short. The, the one hour is so short. Uh, what? I said it's very short. Well, I, I, because uh, usually we do it for 45 minutes, but uh, okay. I, don't, I would like to go on for a few minutes, but uh, I don't know if we can. Um, let me get some instruction here from the technical bosses. Like until six, okay.
it needs a central committee decision. I will wait, just wait. <laughs> Though, well, while they're checking, uh, um, could, you, could you tell us why did you move uh, from Germany first to, into England and then Portugal? I read a few interviews of ours of yours uh, saying that German people, after all, they are racist, they are not letting foreigners integrate. Well, um, first, I don't speak German language, it's my fault. And the second, uh, I don't like to be uh, just a, a decorative uh, sin. Germans think they, they risk my life. I told them, you don't risk my life. You're protecting the, the meaning of the ideology. It's not about me. So, you know, I don't like to stay somewhere people tell me they risk my life. You know, it's like a communist. They always uh, tell people because the communist, you can survive, you know? So I don't survive under communist and also I don't survive uh, under German, uh, German's mercy. They should give the mercy to the, uh, you know, the most, uh, a lot of refugees and a lot of other people. Okay, we got the permission uh, to go on until uh, another 10 minutes or something like that. Very um, good. Yes, so um, are there other questions here from the floor? Isabel, come on, thank you. The, this is a very informal press conference, I will wait. In China, would not go like this. <laughs> Hi again, I just wanted to follow up on Pio's question actually, because I, I'm from the UK. And I read that you wanted to live in the UK for your son's education, and then, and now you, you're in Portugal. So I, I wondered about that part of your journey. Um, as a, as a, some kind of refugee as I am, I realized very late, but uh, I was um, exiled with my father when I was born in Xinjiang. You know, from Beijing to Xinjiang is like from Washington to, to Washington state or to most remote area, you know, where uh, they put all those camps, re-education camps today. So we're maybe the first generation to be re-educated there. And uh, so why I mentioned that is when I was born, I was, have no sense of a home. I don't have, you know, we have a, our very pro proud of the na nation, you know, but we don't have home. And, uh, but once I was being exiled from China, and I'm, I'm not a, just do not have home, but also doesn't have not have my motherland, so called very proud of motherland. And uh, so anywhere is the same depends on I feel comfortable or not. In Germany, I do not feel comfortable. You know, it's, uh, I will not talk about it, it will be too long. But uh, in England, I also not very comfortable, but my son and my girlfriend, they feel very comfortable. They think the English people are very polite and they, they speak soft and they like to explain things and uh, uh, we are very happy in Cambridge, I should say. If they're happy, I'm happy, you know. But as a traveler, I always have to find some place where I can really locate in the future. And uh, even I don't have a long future, it's just a very short uh, next few years. So I have to, that's why I moved to Portugal because I, need, I like to have a sunshine. And uh, also, uh, you know, even I grew up in, in desert, Xinjiang was Gorbi. So I still want to do close to ocean. So Portugal provides the uh, ocean and the sunshine here. And the people also very soft, you know, they're very uh, nice people. So I decided to, to try, you know, but 
till I'm 64 years old. I never called any place, any location as home. So maybe next time I move to Japan, I have no idea. Well, maybe you could uh, go to Italy and mend out uh, all your problems with the Italians after your tweet last year about uh, coronavirus being like pasta. Chinese invented it and Italians spread it uh, all over the world. Would you apologize now in front of everybody no, or do you stay by your joke? Nobody apologizes for a joke. We are not... Uh, so I'm intelligent to take a, a joke seriously. If I have to apologize, this many things need to be apologized before that joke. And unfortunately, China and Italy paid a heavy price at the beginning of the, the crisis. Yeah. You know, this is a fact. And uh, not a fact is China not invited the, the, the you know, pasta. And the people don't like that joke is they always argue about who invented our pasta rather than about the pandemic. This is very interesting. You know, I respect the uh, Italians uh, sentiment about pasta. I, I, I really think they should have a pasta on their flag. So that would really unite the nation uh, much better. That's a good one. Uh, okay. Um... We still have a few minutes. Uh, are there another question? Mara, please. Again, it's the pasta admirer. Um, so you mentioned Xinjiang. Will we see an Ai Weiwei film or installate anything about the Uyghurs? Is this a topic that you would like to explore more thank you well i one of my close friends and uh, his name uh, uh iliham he's been sentenced for life he's a professor he was a professor of this kind of uh, some kind of uh, so-called uh, some kind of university in beijing very nice man very very fine man but sentenced for life. And uh, my 16 years in Xinjiang, I don't even know when we were people. You can see how severe the situation is. We are living under uh, some kind of semi-military camp. There's no, simply no we were people there. And the, why the base being provided there is to to maintain this control of this border uh, te uh, territory. I have no intention to make a artwork about it because uh, simply because uh, I know very little about Uyghur culture, but uh, certainly I know they are fine people. They are very, uh, you know, nice, nice people. And uh, they, they are they are suffered under under this kind of you know Han people's treatment, which absolutely uh, uh, unfair. And uh... Uh, way, you have been uh, constantly criticizing and warning uh, the rest of the world about the one belt or, or one road uh, uh, Chinese uh, plan. Uh, are you still against it? Do you still think it is like a, a Trojan horse that will eventually penetrate our economies and uh, make all of us uh, subjects of China? Well, I, I should have correct it. I, I, the criticizing about uh, China's development, uh, uh, there's uh, two parts. First, I'm, I am a Chinese. I care about China's growth. I, I never really, uh, I appreciate if they can make a, a contribution to 1.4 billion people to, de to develop China become a, a strong uh, state. But at the same time, they should work on their ideology. You know, they cannot simply become a powerful state 
based on the uh, vision and uh, uh, in defending human humanity and the human rights. So that is what I criticize. Them. And about China's expanding power in the world, I think China is very visionary, you know, since Chairman Mao, you know, how could those people even control a new nation and uh, beat the nationalist? This is also, it's like a very, very strategically need to be studied. And, uh, and the China in the 70s, 80s is almost like North Korean today. How can they develop a powerful state with such large population and uh, threatens the world establishment, such like US are so scared of China today. So we have to say China is very strategic, uh, played smartly. And, uh, and the powerful, and they are still growing after pandemic. It maintains a threat to the world establishment. So the real, real problem is not China want to develop. Of course, they develop their way. Any, 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 any species do that, not even talk about state. But the problem is the West can still lasting, you know, the ideology, the, the kind of lifestyle the kind of uh, system, the so-called democracy and the freedom, can they still last? Can they handle it in, in defending the value and they still can make a competition and uh, to win the, the battle? I don't think so. I think the West need a dramatic uh, change to really understand what they are defending and how they are going to win the battle. Talking about epochal change, that is, this is really the last question. A um, couple of days ago, yesterday, I believe, yeah, uh, we have a new president in the United States, but people around the world call this the Asiatic or the Chinese century. Are we going to witness uh, the historical takeover before we both die? Well, uh, I was there soon. I think you will last for a long time. So that, that time frame is not very clear. But uh, I, I, I can think it uh, doesn't matter how many precedents you're changing, still, they just go back to the old uh, time. If you see the precedents just, uh, uh, how do you see the change back to the policies on the first day? It just go back to Obama time. But Obama time is the time that produced Trump. Is that correct? You know, Trump yes. doesn't come out from the sky. It come from Obama time. So we, with same kind of logic, nothing's been solved. If you want to just go back to the old dream, it will be a new nightmare. Thank you, I. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, everybody who participated physically and online to this uh, <laughs> okay. nice press conference. And uh, wish you luck uh, and uh, health for now and for your future. And uh, hope to see you back in Europe sometime. Nice thank you. Thank okay. you. Good luck to you and your family. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. See you at the next press conference.